When I say the word home, what do you think of? For a lot of us, it's great memories, wonderful memories, Christmases, mom's dad, time with our grandparents. But for some of us, when I say home, it just instantly conjures up bad memories. You see, we all, when we say the word home, we, we automatically think about different things. This series is called Home, and it's about God's version of home for you. And so I don't know what your home experience was, but I want you to know this. God has a better home experience for you that's waiting. I was on, my, on the phone with my mom just asking about how many homes did we, we live in? And, and she was just recounting all the places, some that I remember and some that I don't. We moved six times in the first six years of my life. Think about that. That's a lot of movement. And one of the things I'm gonna challenge parents is how to raise kids. And one of the most important things you can give to your kids is stability. Don't move them all over the place. And I realize things happen, life happens, but one of the things that you wanna do is you want to provide a place for your kids to grow up, to connect, and to call home. Now, when I was six years old, something changed. My dad got a job at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and my parents bought a home, I kid you not, on Fiddletown Court. That's why I'm so strange, okay? I was raised on Fiddletown Court. Uh, my my in-laws live on Easy Street, which just makes me mad, right? It's like, what do I gotta do to live on Easy Street? But I was raised on Fiddletown Court, met some of my best friends, lifelong friends there, and I lived in Fiddletown Court from first grade all the way through my sophomore year in college. It was home for me. I could never imagine living somewhere else, loving a place like that. It was so, so special. I learned to ride a bike there. I learned to read and write there. I had my first date there, drove my first car there, right? Learned to skateboard. I mean, all of these wonderful, wonderful memories. But you know, last year I went back there. My parents sold that home a couple of years ago and I went back there and I gotta tell you, I had lots and lots of emotions and lots of feelings, but the one that was the most overwhelming was this. This isn't home. This isn't home. Now, if you would have asked me that 30 years ago, I would have told you you're crazy. But it's amazing how attached we can all become to something that is not permanent. If you're a Christian today, let me tell you why you're so anxious, why you're so worried. You've wrapped up and assumed this is your home, and it's not. Number one, this world is not my permanent home. Everywhere you are, even if you own it, you're renting, because it's all the Lord's, and he's taking it back one day. You're just renting. You're just passing through. And so here's the good news. If you came up with a terrible home life, if you came up you know, with, with an abusive home life, look, I, I want you to know your father in heaven has a better life for you. He has a better home for you. And here's the thing is, if you're like, oh, my family was perfect. Look, you're crazy. Go to counseling and unpack that, okay? <laughs> All families are weird. All families have weirdos. And if you can't think of the one in your family that's the weirdo, it's you. It's you. All families have drama. All people have issues. We're all broken. This is what makes church, church life so exciting, amen? You just get us all together and we just rub elbows with our issues. But this world is not our home. It's not our permanent home. And oftentimes as Christians, our anxiety, we need to remember, is never focused on heaven. It's focused on here and now. What's happening? What's going on? And how am I overwhelmed? The author of Hebrews writes a letter to Christians who are terrified. They're being persecuted, they're overwhelmed, people are abandoning the faith. Things are getting so bad and the tribulation is so real, people are walking away from the faith. Some of the scariest verses in the Bible are Hebrews chapter six and Hebrews chapter seven. And we've been arguing about what those verses mean for 2000 years. But listen to what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 14, listen to these words. For this world is not our permanent home. You see, what was happening to Jewish believers is they were actually losing their homes. The government actually came and was taking their homes and was arresting them for their faith. And they thought they lost everything. Over the years as your pastor, unfortunately, I've had to go to people's homes who've lost everything in a fire. And it always breaks my heart when Christians say this, Pastor, we lost everything. You lost some things, but listen to me, you didn't lose everything. Only God can take everything because only God has everything. 
You lost some things, some valuable things, some precious things, some things that meant a lot to you, but they are not permanent. He says, listen, we are looking forward to a home yet to come, yet to come. One of the famous stories I heard over and over again as a young Baptist kid growing up in church was the story of an old lady who was buried and she wanted a fork in her hand. And if you've heard this story, everybody's like, why does grandma want a fork in her hand? Because when she was growing up, dessert always came at the end. And she would say, save your fork, save your fork because the best has yet to come. And she wanted her grandchildren to know as they wept for her that something better was coming. Dessert was coming. And so she wanted that fork in her hand. And we need to think about that when we've lost everything, when we've given up all hope. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 18 says this, my people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. Man, I hope people in Israel today are praying over this verse, remembering this verse, because there's a lot of angst in Israel today. And despite what side of that issue you're on, we need to pray for them because, man, are, are, do we always love the, the decisions our politicians make? Are we always happy about the people that are in power for us that literally decide our fate on earth? And we need to remember that. And as Christians, as we're watching Fox News or CNN or, or your little special Twitter account where you talk to your alien friends, whatever it is, <laughs> we need to remember, we need to remember that the Lord has promised one day security, one day rest, and one day peace. The apostle Peter also writing to a persecuted church. And not like you're in my persecution where they get your order wrong at Starbucks intentionally because you're a believer, amen? <laughs> but real persecution. Christians were really dying. They were really being arrested. They were being fed to lions and lit up as torches for the Romans during their games in the Colosseum. Peter says this, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from your worldly desires. It's easy to get wrapped up in this world, isn't it? It's easy. Like when I go to Newport Beach and we, 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 we rent a little tiny boat for the hour, you know what I'm talking about? And, and it's like, they don't even care if you crash it, that's how cheap the boat is. I don't like, I don't like drive up and down, you know, uh, Newport Beach going, Lord, bless them, bless them, bless them. I'm like, Lord, you need to deal with them. You know what I'm saying? And why is that? Because I get jealous. Like, what, what did I do wrong? Well, for starters, I didn't pay attention in math class. But it's easy to get wrapped up in what somebody else has, where somebody else goes. This is why so many of you are miserable, because you're on TikTok and Instagram looking at everybody else's vacation. Amen. Instead of thanking God that you had a vacation. Amen. It's easy to get caught up in this world, isn't it? Yes. Man, I don't know what it is, but the Lord, the Lord, as long as I live, the Lord sends crazy people my way. They just know where I am. They find me. It doesn't matter where I am. We stopped off to get gas in somewhere in the middle of Utah. I honestly don't even know where we were. We just were out of gas, so we needed to stop. And there was no like Chevron or Arco. It was one of those, you know, truck stops, you know what I'm talking about? And you just, you just gotta, you know, hold your kids because you don't know what's gonna happen there, kind of stops. And so we pull over and of course, there's a guy next to us who wants a conversation. I just want gas, he wants a conversation. And he says this, he says, I'm coveting your Jeep. That's how he begins the conversation. I said, you're coveting my Jeep? He says, yes. He says, I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I was like, of course you are. Of course, <laughs> of course you are. And he's talking to me, man. And he's got, his mouth looks more like a pumpkin than it does like a preacher. And I'm just like, Lord, I just want to get gas. It's a thousand degrees. I don't even know what city we're in. And he starts to share the gospel with me. And I'm just like, do I look lost? Out of the two of us, <laughs> who looks less saved? And he just, you know, he's just coming in for the kill and he's getting closer and closer and he's on a walker, I kid you not. And he's coming at me and, and I just, you know, I just start to observe his car and he's got a flat tire. And when I say flat, there was no tire, it's just rim. And I said, hey buddy, um, uh, Reverend, you don't have a tire. And he says, I know, I've been here for a couple of days. I'm like, of course you have, waiting for me. <laughs> and. It just, was, it just was so interesting to me. But you know what? I, I, you know, as I asked how I could help him and what we could do to get him on his way, I just really thought about, it's really easy, even as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to get a lot of things wrong. And I, I think the Lord was, was just showing me how much he's blessed me in my life. 
Because we're not stranded at a gas station waiting for a tire. I'm not on a walker in poor health. I'm not missing all my teeth. The Lord has blessed me. And so many of us, we're, we're wrapped up in all the things that we don't have. When's the last time you told the Lord, thank you for what you do have? Hey, Sandals Church, thank you so much for joining in today's message with Pastor Matt Brown. I wanted to take a quick moment to invite you into the work that Sandals Church is doing. One way you can do that is by giving financially. If you head to give.sc, you can do so there. For now, let's get back into our message. And so what happens when we get wrapped up in politics, in economics, in relationships? These things, listen to this, they wage war against your very soul. They wage war against your soul. So what does he say? Be careful to live properly amongst unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. Now you all get to sneak everywhere you go. You get to live two lives. You get to live your life at church and then you get to live your real life. You know what I'm saying? I see you guys in the store, at the grocery store when you try to hide all the beer in your cart. I see it, you see me and you do a U-turn I still got good eyes. I saw you. Listen, I don't get to sneak anywhere. Everywhere I go, you are all watching me. People are watching me. I took my dog to the vet this week. I kid you not. And apparently I cut. Has anybody ever done that? You cut in line at the vet. Dog owners are very peculiar about order. You don't cut in line at the vet. And, and, and here's the truth, I wasn't trying to cut, but my dog is 137 pounds of Satan. That's what my dog is. And everybody's in there with their, they're not even dogs, they're trinkets. I don't know what these are. I don't know, I don't know who decided to give these things life, but they are not, the Lord didn't make these things. They're, you know, they're like two pound, and I don't even know they're alive until their head moves, right? You know, you're like, and my dog, my dog will just, oh, and it's over. And you know, those dogs are like 10 grand, so. So I go up to the front and this guy goes, hey, hey, sir, 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 there's a line here. And I'm, you know, I'm ready to just turn into Bruce Lee, you know, and, but this guy's older, he's on a walker. I don't know what the deal is with men and walkers this week, but <laughs> the Lord is speaking to me. And he said, there's a line. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I just didn't want my dog to hurt any of your dogs. He said, well, I have a cat because his animal was in a box. <laughs> and I was like, well, she'll kill that too. So, um, and he says, I'm here to put my cat down, I know. And now I just feel terrible. I, I cut in line for the guy who's gotta kill his cat. And, and then he says this, and my wife died last month. Oh yeah, I just like, let's go out and drown, drown some puppies. Let's just top the day off. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. I said, can I pray for you? I'm a pastor. And I, you know, I pray with him and he's crying in the lobby of a veterinarian clinic. His wife died, he's gonna put his cat down. He just met a pastor who cuts in line, doesn't believe in order. And I was so glad I didn't lose my, my mind for a minute because I was just trying to get in there and out there. And my dog, I have to have the choke chain, which everybody already judges me. You know, oh, that's cruel. I'm like, no, I'm trying to save you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hurt the dog. I'm trying to prevent you from being bitten and eaten alive. And so, so right when after that happens, I go to pay my bill and the woman behind the counter goes, oh, I go to your church. She said, that was nice to watch. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> oh. I know this is hard for you to believe, but there's a good chance that didn't go that way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I get watched all the time. It's, it's, just part, it's just part of the deal. But you guys, you, you, you think you're not being watched. Your non-believing neighbors are watching you. To you, to them, you're a pastor. You're the holy roller and they watch you. And here's what he says. Look, don't get caught up in this world because it can mess you up. Make sure that you're living an honorable life towards your neighbors. So therefore, listen to this. When God judges the world, they'll honor you because they're like, yeah, you know what? We should have known better. We should have known better. And so think about this. The next time you're gonna put a political sign in your lawn, I'm just making a statement. Yeah, you are, either way. When's the last time we made a statement about honoring God? Next, Jesus is preparing an eternal home for me. That's what he's doing. This week I was struck as I, I was reading through the Gospel of John. In John chapter 13, he begins to talk about one of his best friends is gonna betray him. 
Anybody ever been stabbed in the back by a good friend? Oh, man. And if you haven't, it's coming. So it's just, you know. But his good friend, his good friend is going to betray him and sell him out for some coin. And he tells the disciples this, and they're all upset, and they're not exactly sure who this is. And then Jesus immediately changes the subject and washes their feet. And he says, look, in the same way that I've loved you, I want you to love others. And then he says, I'm gonna go to die, and they're all unsettled. And it's, to be fair, it's a weird sermon, okay? Like, you guys think my sermons are weird? Listen to Jesus. You'd have been lost. You'd have had some questions. And so how does John 14 begin? Let not your hearts be troubled. What just happened? Jesus just freaked him out. He freaked him out. He's saying he's going to die. They're gonna to go to Jerusalem. They don't want him to go. One of them's gonna betray him. They're not sure who that is. And they're really, really scared. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Listen, he says, believe in God. Believe also in me. You see, here's the thing. When you're freaked out and you're scared, you know what, well, you know what faith is? Faith is a shield that protects you from the enemy's arrows. And some of you have let down that shield and that's why you're so afraid. That's why you're so scared to death. Like some of you guys, you watch the Olympics and you're like, the world's going to hell. Have you read your Bible? Like, have, it doesn't end well. I mean, I'm not saying the blue Smurf guy is in there, but I, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know who you think these people worship. They just got honest. All the Olympics was, was honesty. That's all it was. Just for a brief moment, they're like, here we are. And some of you are like, oh. That's all it is. That's what happens when you reject God. You worship sex and everything else. And what's sad is, you know, they're mocking the book of Revelation. Those things are coming. And it's not a play. It's real. He says, believe in God. Believe also in me. Look, when you're scared, when you're frightened, Believe in Jesus. He says, in my father's house are many rooms, many rooms. If it were not so, he said, what I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. He says, look, I'm not kidding. You're gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. And if I go to prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again and I will take you to myself. I'll take you to myself. Look, if you're a Christian today, you're gonna be okay. And you don't have to worry about how this whole thing ends because guess how it ends for you? In the arms of Jesus. That's how it ends. It's gonna be okay. He says, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You see, Jesus didn't come to earth to give you a holy recipe. He came to earth to give you a relationship with him. He has always been interested in one thing and that is you. That's you. And then he says this, and you know, you know the way where I'm going. Thomas, I love Thomas. He's like, ah, uh, Lord, <laughs> we don't know where you're going. We don't know. Okay, can I be honest with you? Sometimes I read the Bible. Listen, I get confused. I know you're like, I'm going to another church. All those pastors that tell you they're never confused are lying. Look, they're on the front row seat. They're hearing it the first time. Thomas is like, I have some questions. And, and Lord Jesus is like, yes. He's like, well, actually many questions. He says, Lord, hey, I love Thomas. We, like he throws all of them under the bus. We, all the chickens will not say this, but we do not know where you are going. You know? I mean, think about that. When, our, when other pastors preach, and I know you've been listening to a lot of our communicators, what I always tell them is land the plane, land the plane, land the plane. You ever heard a sermon where you're like, did we land? I don't know. Did we land? Where are we going? Some of you didn't even know when someone's preaching. Did we take off? I don't know. What happened? There are some very untalented communicators for Jesus out there. Amen? So he's, he's saying, Lord, we, 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 don't, we don't know where we're going. Like fantastic message, very inspirational. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And listen to what he says, how can we know the way? And Jesus replies with one of the most famous, verse, famous verses ever said. He says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Listen to me, the location is Jesus. So many of your friends all think they're going to heaven when they die. Listen to me, 
There's no such thing as a destination called heaven. There's a destination called Jesus. And he's the only one that can get you there. Like, you know, when you go to funerals, everybody's in a better place. Everybody, go, like, which way is heaven? Nobody knows. Only Jesus knows. And you're not gonna find it. Your soul is not gonna be like, you know, some pioneer that finds it and discovers it. Only Jesus knows because that's where he came from. You see, if you and I went on our journey back to Fiddletown Court, you might get lost. I never would. Do you know why? That's where I'm from. Jesus is from heaven. That's his home. That's where he came from. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. Look, Jesus is preparing a place for you, a home for you. Think about that. Let that settle you. Let that relax you. Let that give you hope. Colossians 3.1, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. You know what never makes me anxious? Heaven. You know what makes me anxious every day? Earth. Earth. Constantly. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we were a millimeter away from civil war as a country. We were that close. And by the grace of God, and I have no idea why, and Trump's twitchy head, he did that. And God has graciously given America some more time to figure this out. I don't know why. I don't know why. Our country is a mess. Our world is a mess. You know where it's not a mess? In heaven. Because they know who their leader is. And that's where Christ sits. And so when you're all upset and you're all anxious, think about one day I get to live in a place where there aren't snipers. Where there aren't conspiracies. Where there just is peace. Where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. We gotta think about that. Instead of getting all riled up, about the Olympics, why don't we just invite people to the peace that Jesus has for them? Because you know what the world is doing? The world, the world is ruining even the things that used to relax us. Remember when sports was sports? Do you remember that? So young people are like, I don't, I don't know what you talk about. There was a time, right, where we just, sport was just sport. Now everything's political. Everything's conspiratorial. Everything's a mess. The world is taking everything away from us. It, and, and, and that's what they do. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ wants to give you peace. So here's the trick. Here's the switch. This world is not my home. Jesus is preparing a home for me. I must prepare to live in the house that Jesus is building. So if this is not my home, are you packed for your trip? Some of you never think about this, right? You see, everywhere I go, I pack. Where am I going? Is it cold? Is it hot? Where is it? Is it on the equator? Is it summer? Is it winter? Is it raining? Is it dry? Where am I going? You see, whenever I take a trip, I pack for where I'm going. Some of you have never thought about this. You've never packed a day in your life for heaven. And I gotta tell you, there's some things that you got with you that aren't gonna make it. They're not welcome in heaven. Did you know that? They're not welcome. There's some things that you don't get to take. Now, this is my suitcase. Oh, it's super cool. It's so camouflage. Listen, we're gonna talk about this next week when I talk about building your home. Let me tell you, when you're a dad and you have daughters, you know how you get your suitcase? You get whatever no one else likes. That's what you get. Okay, when you have sons, they don't care anyways. They don't wanna go on the trip, right? But my daughter ordered this and said it was too manly. So she gave it to me. And now everywhere I walk in the airport, people thank me for my service. <laughs> Thank you for your service. And I just, you, you got it. And I just keep walking. But when's the last time you packed for heaven? When's the last time you organized your life and you said, you know what, this attitude, this personality trait, this habit, this can't go with me. So I better get rid of this now. C.S. Lewis writes an incredible book and it's called The Great Divorce. And in C.S. Lewis's book, 
people get an opportunity to go right to the gates of heaven. And as they step on the grass, they don't like how the grass feels. The trees are too big. The fruit is too large to eat. And what they decide, person after person after person, is to go back to hell. And do you know why that is? Because they never lived their life preparing to live in heaven. And listen to me, it felt foreign. Do you know what felt comfortable? Hell. You see, in C.S. Lewis's theology, he says the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Now, I don't know why this is. I can't always control where I'm reading my Bible. And for whatever reason, in July, to comfort my soul, the Lord had me in Ezekiel and Revelation. <laughs> like every single day when I was doing my quiet time, I'm like, here we go. You know, it was like bungee jumping every morning. Like, Lord, be with me. And my wife was like, why are you reading that? Because there are different amounts of books in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I read one chapter out of each. And so just randomly in July, when the president's almost assassinated, I'm in Revelation and Ezekiel. And every morning I'm like, dear God, save us all. But here's the thing. Revelation is a very, very scary book. It just is. But here's the beauty. It doesn't end scary. The ending is amazing. And so in Revelation 21, verses one through eight, John sees Listen to this, a new heaven and a new earth. He says, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. How? I don't know. And anybody who's trying to explain it to you, they don't know either. He had this vision. And I want you to vision a new earth, a new heaven. And he said, I heard a shout from the throne. A shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. You see, so many of you have Christians have got it wrong. You think it's all about you going to heaven. No, 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 no. The gospel is about heaven coming to earth. It's about him coming to be with us. Listen to this. This is how Revelation ends. He will live with them. This is how the Bible ends. Not you in heaven with God. It's God coming from heaven to live with you on a new earth and he will live with them, and they will be his people. And listen to this, and God himself will be with them. And if you're not a Christian today, and you're like, you know what? Religion has caused more wars than anybody else. It's not true. And if you don't believe me, do a little history of the 21st century. Communist countries are atheists. Hitler was an atheist. And they killed more people in that century than all other centuries combined. You see, the problem's not religion. The problem has and always will be people like you and me. So here's the thing. Why, why should we hope for this? Why should we pray for this? Why should we focus on this? Because he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. He will do what I couldn't do to the old man putting his cat down who just lost his wife. I can pray for him. I cannot wipe away his tears. I cannot do it. Man, this world, this world's got stuff in it. And some of you, if you and I sat down and you told me your story, I'd be crying. Man, don't you wanna live in an earth where that's no longer your story? Don't you wanna do like what I did? You go back to the home that you were raised in and it doesn't seem like home anymore. It just seems like a, a weird dream. That's how my house was. It wasn't home anymore. Listen to me, as much as I loved it, I don't miss it anymore. And I know that's hard for you to believe, but there will be a time when the Lord Jesus will return and you will not miss this world anymore. Amen? And there will be no more death. No more death. One of the things I did while I was on vacation was I FaceTimed with a family who lost their one-year-old. Man. Every time I see a little kid dying, every time, it just, it takes my breath away. I mean, death is never easy, but when it's kids, whew. I don't know about you, but I wanna live in a world where we don't bury one-year-olds. For those of you who've been to Israel with me, you've been 
and you may not even know this, but you've been with me to that place in Israel, the Druze community, the Druze community, where there were kids out playing on a playground. They're playing soccer. They were going down the slide. They're playing in the sandbox. And Hezbollah launched a rocket. And they won't own it, but they did. They shot it. And it killed a bunch of kids playing on a playground. I don't know about you, but I, I want to live in a world where that doesn't exist. There will be no more death, listen, and no more sorrow. No more crying, no more pain. My wife came home yesterday and I was holding my wrist. She's like, what do you do? I said, I don't even want to tell you. <laughs> You've heard me say this, young people. When you get hurt, there's an amazing story. It's amazing. You did something really stupid. You know, you were racing a car, jumping off a bike, on a skateboard. When you get old, there's no story. <laughs> I said, I don't even want to tell you. She said, did you break your wrist? I said, maybe. She said, what happened? I said, I sat down. <laughs> I, I sat down and I put my hand down. I didn't karate, karate chop a brick. I put my hat down and my wrist went, nope. <laughs> like, I didn't want to go to the doctor because I don't want to tell the doctor that. What happened? Nothing. My wrist just quit. Don't you want to live in a world where there's no more pain? And some of you young people are like, well, I don't believe that'll happen. It will. You live long enough. It will. I mean, there's gonna be a day, young people, when you can't even eat a donut anymore. Yeah, it will destroy you. <laughs> All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Listen to me. Genesis 1, it's just the start. Look at our world. Look at what he did in six days. I can't wait to see what he does in 2000. Can you, can you, I mean, I can't imagine. Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down. For what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Wow, we live in an age where the truth is hard to figure out. And he said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Listen to these words if you're not a Christian today. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. God has something for you today, something for your marriage, something for your children, something for your life, something different to all who are thirsty. And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God, and they will be my children. What is God building? A home for his children. But listen to me, not everybody makes it. Not everybody's going to heaven. Not everybody's gonna be with Jesus. But the cowards, the unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers and liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I got to go be with uh, our youth kids at camp before I went on vacation and it was fabulous. Let me tell you something, you wanna make a difference in this world, invest in a teenager. Invest in a teenager. I was in tears as I watched hundreds of kids from our church, from all of our campuses, worshiping God, praising God. I literally, I, I couldn't even sing. I was so moved by it. But one of the young kids came up to me. He said, pastor, we need to talk. I was like, oh, here we go. Here we go. He said, I don't believe in hell. And all I said was, well, Jesus does. And he just looked at me. I was like, you don't have to debate with me. You have to debate with him. But here's the thing, hell wasn't made for you. The book of Revelation says hell was made for Satan and the angels who rebelled against God. It was not made for you. It's not where you're supposed to go. It's not how you're supposed to end. 
So what do you do today? What do you do? 2 Corinthians 5, 6. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Listen to this, yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. Amen, old people? Amen. The young people are like, I don't know, I don't know. For then we will be at home with the Lord. Listen to this. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we all must stand before Christ to be judged. And we will receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. What do we need to do? We need to start packing. We need to get ready. And let me just say this. There are some of you today, you got some junk in here that ain't gonna make it. It ain't gonna make it. And you need to start pulling some stuff this week. Specifically, when I went over the small group questions, I wanna challenge this. What's some of the stuff that you're carrying around that you gotta let go of this week? Because it's not going to heaven. The Lord is like, nah, uh That evil stuff isn't coming in here with me. He won't allow it. What is it that you need to release? And for those of you who are not Christians, here's the only way your name is written in the book of life. Here's the only way. When you repent of your sins and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says all who call upon him, all of them, Muslims, atheists, Buddhists, Christians, Catholics, Sandalites, all who call upon him will be saved. You need to do that this week. So this week we're talking about the house the Lord is preparing for us. Next weekend, we're gonna talk about how to build your house. How to build your house. How to build the kind of house where you raise the kind of kids you want. Listen to me, the world isn't gonna stop. They're not gonna stop pressuring. They're not gonna stop pushing. They're gonna keep coming at us to the very end because here's what Revelation says. No matter how many opportunities they get to repent, they don't. They don't. And they curse God to the very end. That doesn't need to be your story. Your story can be different. Your story can change if you are ready to repent today and place your faith and trust in Jesus. And why? Because he has a home for you. He has a house for you. He's building a place for you. And why? Because he loves you. That is not the question. The question is, do you love him? That's the question. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would help us as Christians to live every day looking forward to the new heaven, the new earth, and our new home. A place, Lord, where there's no tears, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no sorrow, there's no pain. Lord, the place where you rule and you reign. Lord, where we get to spend our lives and our eternity with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us enough to save us, to die for us, and to prepare a place for us. Let that comfort us this week. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.